The Lord Jesus, he has caused quite a stir since he first stepped into the public arena, since he first began his public ministry. In chapter 4, you may recall that Matthew explained that Jesus has begun to proclaim the kingdom of God to the people of Israel, specifically in the region of Galilee. If you're not familiar with the country of Israel, Galilee is that northern rural area. Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom to the people in that region. He's teaching in their synagogues. And as we read in Matthew chapter 4, healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Matthew records that his fame then spread and great multitudes followed him. He says that great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, sort of the uh, eastern regions of Galilee, also from Jerusalem, from Judea. Now this is the southern section of Israel and beyond the Jordan. So even though Jesus is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom in, in the north regions of Israel, in that rural Galilee, his fame has spread all around from east to west, from north to south, from Galilee down to Judea. People are coming from all over the country to see him, to hear him, and if need be, to be healed by his hand. Matthew also tells us that after Jesus preached his sermon on the mount, that the people who heard him were astonished they were amazed at his teaching because he taught with great authority. When he preached, he said, do this because I have said it. You've heard your teachers say it this way, but I tell you, and I expect you to hear me and to listen to me and to obey me. He concluded the Sermon on the Mount by saying, you listen to my words, you obey my sermon, you're like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Now, I would never, nor would any priest or rabbi in that day. No clergyman would ever stand up and say, forget the word of God, just do what I tell you to do. Now Jesus, of course, wasn't saying, forget the word of God, but he was saying, as I speak, you are hearing the words of God. This is great authority, and it shocked those who heard him. And it caused even greater multitudes to follow him, as the opening verse of chapter 8 tells us. Now the master has been busy with the business of his father, and he has become exhausted, and rightly so. In verse 18 of this chapter, Matthew has already mentioned that Jesus has commanded that a boat should carry him away from the crowds. And yet, even in, in his attempted exit, as we looked last week, he is held up by two men. Wait, 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 Jesus, I want to go with you wherever you go. And they each had their own excuses, and Jesus allowed them to give their excuses. Although to one, he did say, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. You recall that you follow me? The implication seems to indicate that that man did not follow Jesus after all. And so... Jesus finally makes it to the boat which was called for him. And we pick up the story here in verse 23. Now, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered by the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful? O oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea I obey I know that the him. great storm that frightened his disciples, causing them to ask this question once this great storm was stilled. I note the great fear which brought his disciples to him, pleading before him that he would save them. 
And third, the great question which this great miracle produced, who can this be? What man is this? You know, it's one thing to hear a great sermon. It's, it's one thing even to see a miracle, somebody healed. It's quite another for somebody to speak to the wind and to the sea and for the winds to calm down and for the sea as, as to be As we approach this text, as we look at this storm, I want to note one thing before we get there. Notice as he gets into the boat that his disciples followed him. Notice again that these were the same who received his command to ready the boat. In our previous study, we looked at the two men, as I mentioned earlier, who professed a desire and a will to follow the master. The true disciples, those called by Christ himself, however, are the ones who actually hear his word, obey his word, and follow him. When push comes to shove, this is what always distinguishes the true followers from the false. And I think it's important just to note that as we move on. And so here we're told by Matthew that a great storm arose on the sea. So monstrous was the storm that the boat was covered over by the waves. And yet we read that Jesus was asleep. As we noted earlier, the master had intended to get some rest. No doubt, he quickly found his way, as Mark records, to the stern of the boat where he laid down. He, he found himself a pillow, Mark actually tells us, and lays down on the pillow there in the stern of the boat and was surely asleep before the boat had hardly launched into the open depths. He was apparently so tired that even the increasing wind and waves could not disturb his slumber. He slept so deeply that as this raging storm developed, he was not awakened. The waves begin to cover the boat, and yet the master sleeps on. As we shall see in the next verse, the disciples are unnerved by this peaceful sleep of the master. They're truly upset. This is disturbing. Hey, we're in trouble and he's asleep. We are in conflict, under great affliction and distress, and yet he is at peace. They're unnerved by this. They're disturbed by this. They're upset by this. And so it is, I notice, that many are upset and disturbed when a Christian faces the most tempestuous of storms and yet seems to be still in their faith, at rest in their Father's love, at peace though the storm rages around them. But mark it well. This is the Christian's singular expectation to have it as Jesus promised that through the hardship, under the weight of the cross and in the raging storm, as Jesus said, as Jesus promised, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It is this kind of peace which caused Stephen to look up as stones were hurled at his face. And he saw the Son of Man, this same Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. It is this peace which caused Paul and Silas, after they had been beaten and imprisoned, to sing hymns at the midnight hour. It is this peace which has kept the hearts of so many persecuted saints, so many believers martyred to death. And so there was Jesus asleep in the storm. He was at peace when others were fearful. And now let's talk about this fear. This fear which brought his disciples to him for aid. Now it has often been noted, and we should also keep in mind, that the men who we see here that are so fearful 
These were sailors. These were men of the sea. These were experienced fishermen. We met them in chapter 4 as Matthew introduced them to us at the docks. They were not only fishermen, but apparently successful at their trade. They were making a living on the Sea of Galilee. Peter and Andrew, James and John, two sets of brothers, both engaged in the family business. Yet this storm scared them, caused them to quiver in fear. It was apparently so ferocious that they expected that this storm may indeed claim their very lives. It finally brought them to desperation. What kind of desperation? These four fishermen were so desperate in their fear that they all came, all four of these fishermen, they all approached the one person on the boat who is not a sailor, a preacher who was a former carpenter, not a man of the sea, not a fisherman, but a preacher. They all come to Jesus. He's their mentor, their teacher, their beloved rabbi. But he's truly the one who should be the least help. He's the one that wouldn't know the riggings of the boat. How to keep things afloat when the storm is raging. He is the one who should be least able to help them. And yet, we hear their cry, Lord, save us. We are perishing. Just what did they expect? I don't think that they expected what was about to happen. I don't think that they expected what Jesus was about to do in answer to their pleas for help. Whatever they expected, it was not that Jesus would rebuke the winds and the sea. That he would literally get up and make the storm be quiet. They were afraid. They were desperate. They didn't know what else to do. But let's wake up this sleeping preacher. He had healed the sick. But what does that mean in that he could help them now? From what we read later, I don't think that they could have ever imagined that he could do anything for them beyond, okay, maybe this is what it was, giving them a comforting word, an encouraging thought. The preacher, the comforter. Surely Jesus will allay our fears. All these years later, all too often, I think that we are still like this. We are like those fearful disciples of old, thinking they were about to drown at sea. We have so much more than they did. We have the knowledge of Christ as the Son of God, the King of Kings to whom all power and authority is given. We have the fullness of the Scriptures and the testimony of the ages which has come down to us. And yet, when the wind rages in its fury, doesn't our courage yet evaporate? And we, want, we, we run to Christ, wondering what he might do, if anything at all. How he might help us, though he probably won't. Seems like he's asleep while we are perishing. Seems like he may not really care for us after all. And yet... Our fear brings us to Him. As much as we have received in the many years since this story, as much as these disciples themselves would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, they would see Him after His resurrection. They would testify unto Him through their writings of the Scriptures, through their own deaths for His name's sake. John, through his persecution at Patmos, through the ages, we have received so much more knowledge than these men had. These men were face to face with the man, Jesus Christ. And to them, he was the one that they would hope to be the Messiah. They believed the word of John the Baptist who led them to him. And yet, though they wanted it to be true, you, you see so often that they're not really sure if it is true. I mean, Peter, one second, will say... 
you know, we believe that you are the Son of God. And yet, in the next instant, Jesus is forced to rebuke him for his foolishness, for his short-sightedness, for his lack of faith. These disciples, they go up and down. And it seems through the ages, though we have so much more than they did at this time, we have history, we have the scriptures, we have the true testimony, we have so much more fuller revelation than they had, and yet our fear seems to be just the same. Is he going to help? Is he just going to sleep there? Is he going to wake up? Is he going to help us? Is he going to save us? Is he going to protect us? Is he going to heal us? Is he going to give us the wisdom necessary? Is he going to hold this relationship together? Is he going to help us with our children, with our sons, with our daughters, with our families, with our work, with our, our job? Is he going to help us? Is he going to be there? Is he going to calm the storm? And I don't think we tend to have much more faith than these disciples had. Yet, their fear brought them to him caused them to reach out to him. And even in our day, I suppose it is good that at least our fear would drive us to Christ, whether or not we are as full of faith as we should be. And so we come to the question, and we have two questions that are put before us, one from the master and the other from the disciples. First, Jesus rebukes his disciples, why are you so fearful? And then he calls them people of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. They've seen him heal the sick. They've seen him open the blind eyes. They've seen him help the poor people. They've seen him preach the gospel with great authority and power. And yet, they lack faith. Haven't you seen enough from me? You heard the words of John the Baptist. You've seen me fulfill his word and the scriptures. And yet you're so fearful. You have little faith. And then he rebukes the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. We begin with a great storm, and we end with a great calm. Matthew's implication to me is obvious. The disciples should have trusted their master, and so should we. So should we, no matter how bleak, how dark, how frightening, we should trust the master. Come what may, this world is passing away and heaven is on the horizon. The Holy Bible, the scriptures, constantly exhorts us with such words as walk by faith, not by sight. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yet, this is merely a subtlety that Matthew glosses over rather quickly as he lingers for a moment on the reaction of the disciples themselves to this incredible demonstration to the power of Jesus Christ. Matthew highlights the question that the disciples ask amongst themselves. Who can this be? Well, who did you think it was? John the Baptist said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. You guys are believing and expecting that this is the Messiah prophesied of old. The Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one of God. And yet, here they are, seeing all the signs of Messiah, seeing the scripture fulfilled, and they wonder, who is this guy? They follow him because they think he's the Messiah. R remember when they go and get Nathaniel in the Gospel of John, they say, hey, Nathaniel, come follow us. Come check this guy out. We think he's the Messiah. <laughs> okay, this is what they thought. And yet when they see him act exercising power, both over sickness and demons and over nature itself, they wonder, who could this possibly be? Who could this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? By the way, Mark states that this caused them to be even more afraid than they were of the storm. Mark says that they feared exceedingly as they beheld this miracle. Initially, they feared the storm. Now they fear the one who has power over the storm. Who can this be? Who can this be but the Son of God? God the Son, truly 
Emmanuel, God with us. And yet, have you thought it through? What are the ramifications of that? What are the ramifications of standing in the presence of the ruler of nature itself? The ruler of the world. The ruler of humanity. If the winds and waves must obey him, then truly all authority is his. This is but a slight demonstration of his fuller authority. If he has this authority, then truly he has all authority. The power of life and death must be in his grip. Indeed, he must have the power to open and no man can shut. He must then also have the power to shut and no man can open. Can this be the root and offspring of David, the bright and the morning star? Can this be the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Lord of lords, the king over all kings? This must be. These, these men must be standing in the presence of the one who is truly the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, proved by the fact that creation bows before him, obeys him. God our Savior, to whom be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. If the winds and the waves obey his voice, how can we not but bow our knees before him? and worship him and follow him. And what of those who continue in their rebellion? What of those who do not bow the knee before him? Jesus would speak with such authority as to say, all judgment has been given to me. And he would say later, one day there will be a great judgment and there will be my people, my sheep, on my right hand, who I will usher into the place of promise, into heaven prepared for them, into the kingdom of God. But on my left, there will be the goats. There will be the sinners who continue in their rebellion. And they will go off into outer darkness, where there is gnashing of teeth. If the winds and waves obey his voice, can we do no less? We must know his voice and we hear his voice through his word. We must be in his word to know his voice because it is imperative that we obey him. See, if he is the king above all kings, if he is the firstborn above all creation, and we are of his creation, we must bow the knee. It is it is upon us. The weight of his glory is upon us and it must bring us into submission to him and we must bow and we must obey just as creation obeys him. For there will be a great judgment for those who refuse and who disobey and who continue in their rebellion. As it has been said and so it is true, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of both wisdom and knowledge. These men in this boat, these four disciples, they were afraid. First, they were afraid of the nature that they could see, the wind and the waves that were overwhelming them. Finally, they were afraid of the one who had authority over the storm. The great storm didn't seem so great in light of the great power that was exercised over the storm. And these men experienced firsthand the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. To stand in the presence of the one who could rebuke the wind and the waves. And to stand in his presence is to know as you look into his eyes, as you bow the knee before him, that he has the authority to rebuke you. To set you straight. To set you right. To tell you what to do. To correct you to tell you how you should endure the storm, to rebuke you for feigning, uh, to, for lacking faith in the storm. Oh, you of little faith, why are you so fearful? It's because your eyes are fixed on this world. 
Your eyes are fixed on everything that's important to you rather than what's important to the Father. Your eyes are fixed on yourself rather than on the glory of God. And so your faith shrinks because your faith is based upon how good it goes for you. The better you feel, the, the more resources you have, the more prosperous you become, your faith becomes increased. Well, I really trust God. Look what he's done for me. Look what he's given to me. But suddenly when we are struck down, when the storm overpowers us, when we realize how weak we truly are, and when we are humbled, when suddenly our self is shrunk down to size and humiliated by the storm around us, when suddenly our pride is slapped down to the floor, when we're knocked off our high horse, well, in that place, all of a sudden our faith also begins to shrink. As things don't go our way, then we begin to doubt. Then we begin to wonder. Then we are full of fear. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Why are you fearful? My glory is at stake in your life. Lift me up. Be a testimony. Be a witness. Be the one who stands strong through the storm. Because you should know that I'm your master, I'm your redeemer, redeemer I'm your savior, and I will make you stand. I will keep you strong. For when you are weak, then I am able to be your strength. My grace is sufficient for you. But to some of us, we'd say, but your grace isn't really what I'm looking for. I want what I want. I want you to do what I think you should do. I want to sit on the throne, and I want to command you on how to behave according to my life. Here's what you should give me. Here's what you should do for me. Here's what you should be to me. And when Jesus scoots us off the throne and situates himself back on the throne and rebukes us, we must hear him. These disciples, the fear of the Lord was brought into their life that day. The fear of the Lord Jesus Christ as one who is ruler over all and ruler over them. <coughs> and what was the results of this? The results were that these men would be some of the strongest of the apostles. They would be part of those 12 men who would go out throughout all the world testifying of this one. Testifying of the one who had power over the storm. But it started with the fear of the Lord. Who, who can this be? Wait a minute. The, the Lord is different than I expected. The Lord behaves differently than I thought he would behave. He, he doesn't do things the way I think they should be done. He does it his own way. And he is fearful. It is fearful to stand in his presence. The one who has power to rebuke nature and certainly has the power to rebuke me. But the fear of the Lord brought these men wisdom. It brought these men knowledge. They began to grow in the grace and the knowledge of their master, the Lord Jesus. And so must we. Let us pray.